This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. As always, I've got my right-hand man, Kellen Finney, here with me. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Peter Vogel, CEO and founder of LeafWire. Peter, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? Doing great. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me on. We're, we're excited to kind of dive in. Kellen, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How about yourself, Brian? I'm doing well, thanks. So before we kind of dive in, Peter, I'd love to get a little background about you and how you got into the cannabis space. Yeah, for sure. I, I was, before cannabis, I was in the tech startup space for about 20 years, and I've helped co-found and worked for lots of startups in the kind of online marketing and advertising space. And that was where I was basically since I got out of college. And then back in, I guess now it's about 2017, I had lunch with a, a buddy who I knew from also being in the tech startup space, uh, a guy who's now CEO of a company called Simplifya. Uh, his name is Marion Marathison, very experienced guy in the cannabis space. And he and a bunch of investors had come up with this idea for LeafWire, uh, but they, they were all running their own companies. And they had no one to kind of take it and run with it. So we had lunch. I was kind of bored of the same tech startup world that I'd been in for 20 years. And I lived in Denver. So obviously tons of people around me worked in cannabis and I knew it was a legit real industry. And I, I basically you know, said to my wife, you know, where do I want to be in five years? Do I want to be stuck in the same industry or do I want to be, you know, an experienced cannabis executive with, you know, lots of contacts and knowledge and be in an industry that's booming. So I made that call and decided for my future down the road that cannabis was the industry that was going to be the place to be. So I jumped in head first and haven't looked back. So for those who are just unfamiliar with LeafWire, can you give us the simplistic version of what it is and the value it brings to the space? Yes, would love to, of course. So the simplest way we pitch LeafWire to new people who've never heard of us is that we're the LinkedIn of the cannabis and hemp industry. So we're the largest business network in cannabis. There, there's not really any other business networks out there that you know have any audience or that are you know known by anyone. Um, so we're we're mostly the only really business network, and we're you know by far any of the other people that have uh, sites that are anywhat similar. We're probably 10x bigger, and we're up to we now have about 40,000 members, and those 40,000 members all join, create profiles. So just like a LinkedIn or Facebook, you join as an individual, create your profile, and you can add your company and your experiences. And we've had about 18,000 company profiles created as well. So that's 18,000 companies in the space. So it's pretty wide following. And, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we often have, you know, a thousand people on the platform, you know, posting news, promoting events, connecting, messaging, commenting, et cetera. So it's, it's a pretty engaged, vibrant community. It's a very clean dashboard. So I guess my question to you would be, do you have to be in the industry to be operating on LeafWire? Uh, you do not. Uh, we don't have any requirements of who joins. We have a job board with thousands of cannabis and hemp jobs. So if you want to come on and look for a job, you know, great. If you want to come on and learn about the industry because you want to get into it, you know, great as well. People always ask me when they're, they're new in the industry what they should do, how they should get started. And I always tell them, one, to get onto LeafWire and just start reading the news feed every day, see what everyone's posting, get a feel for the industry, read the news. And when you see a lot of the articles, you can go subscribe to their newsletters. And then all of a sudden, you could be getting 10 newsletters a day. And you can get a really good gauge on the industry just by seeing what's everyone writing about, what are people asking about, what's... What's everyone in LeafWire keep posting? Like what events, what questions, what, what industries are hot? And then you can also, if you want to get a little more aggressive, you can start connecting with people versus just, you know, a lot of the users are passive. They just want to watch and listen. You know, a lot of people deal with social media differently. If you want to get more involved and you actually want to get more connected, or if you want people to actually reach out to you, you need to start connecting with people. You, you need to start posting occasionally. You need to start commenting, liking, like participate, you know, like any social network or business network, the more you participate, you know, the, the better your returns will be. So that, that's, that's what I tell people when they're getting into the industry. So yes, we welcome new people. Most people we get are people who already work in the industry, but we're happy to have anyone who wants to come learn about the cannabis industry or look for a job. 
Yeah, I think that's really well said. And for those who have the hesitancy with the social media because their Aunt Sarah is liking all their posts, they don't have to worry about Aunt Sarah being on LeafWire, right? You can you can operate on there. And I think, you know, what you said, Peter, is really valuable for, for our listeners out there who are interested in the space but are kind of unfamiliar with exactly how to start, right? It's, it's such a daunting task with the industry being so ever-evolving and where exactly to start. And I, I think what you said is perfect, right? Just start somewhere and continue to operate forward. And utilizing a platform like LeafWire is a really good resource for those out there who are John familiar. So Kellen, where do you get your news? How do you operate with other individuals? Obviously we're connected with a bunch of different people across the space. Are you utilizing similar platforms? Kind of dive into there. Yeah, no, I actually do utilize LeafWire for exactly what Peter was saying. I just use it to scroll the news and kind of get an idea of what's trending in the space. I do it probably once a week. It helps us with uh, keeping our finger on the pulse and uh, see what everyone else is kind of talking about in the space. I use that and then Reddit as well as uh, 4 p.m. So there's a bunch of really good sources out there, but I like LeafWire because it's like um, almost like my Apple News, you know, how it like combines all these different sources to look at. So then you can go into these various rabbit holes is what what my favorite thing about it is. We also have, I'm sure you get to, we have an email now that we've recently rebranded as the Daily Wire. It goes out every day and we, we curate and pick what we think are like the top six Posts of the day. So these are all user generated posts from members. They're either posting mostly it's news or events, things like that, that we think would be, you know, applicable or interesting to everyone. So, so we do, we do just that when, when we, when we do that daily email, we're trying to make it an easy way that someone could look and see what we think are like the top six things of the day. And we, and we put that in the email and send it out every day. So that, that's a kind of a good point you made of, I think, what's valuable to people is being able to see what's relevant in a kind of a quick way. So I want to take two steps, well, probably a bunch more steps backward. The idea of LeafWire, <laughs> right? Like, obviously, you're having that conversation with your friends. What sort of, like, thought process was it? Was it the idea of a, a cannabis-based community of trying to bring everyone together? Can you kind of take us through that idea? Because I think, or at least my perspective, I'm always interested in hearing how these early conversations happen with founders, with understanding that, like, this is the idea I think I'm ready to kind of dive in with. Can you kind of share some information right. there? Sure. Yeah. It actually did evolve a little bit. Um, when I first came on, the concept was a little more to be uh, the angel list of cannabis. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with angel list, but it's basically a, it became very popular in Silicon Valley for tech startups to go on and then investors to go on and meet them. So it was kind of like a meeting platform for techie startups and in the beginning, it was mostly VCs and Silicon Valley folks, and then it expanded. So the idea was to create a platform where investors could meet companies who were looking to raise funds. So when we first launched, I mean, LeafWire, it kind of looked the same and it operated the same. Uh, we realized pretty fast, it's really hard to make money from companies who are fundraising, even trying to get them to pay a monthly subscription fee of 50 to 100 bucks a month like was like pulling teeth. So it was hard to figure out how to monetize it correctly. It didn't really function as we thought it would. And we also found it was really hard for investors to wade through hundreds of companies, a lot of which, you know, in cannabis, there's a lot of brand new young companies, which really aren't far enough along for investors to be interested. So we had the dual problem, one of not really having a direct monetization strategy. We thought we did when we started, but it turned out it didn't really work like we thought. And then we found out it wasn't even that valuable to investors because there's so many companies and most investors were hesitant to kind of act on their own. Uh, And then at the same time, we were getting thousands of people joining and using LeafWire much more like a LinkedIn. So we realized, hey, why don't we pivot a little bit here? We'll still have investors join. We'll still let companies post about their fundraising, but let's focus more on being a networking platform for the entire industry. And so that that's where, when that shift happened and we realized that we could be that to the entire industry and not just, you know, the folks who are trying to raise money. Yeah, I think that's that's really important because obviously in a startup, failing fast is really the most critical. And, and what we originally described as a business plan, sometimes you realize, oh man, we really missed the marker here. And what we thought was actually was going to be our business case is really far to the right. And the most important way is to continue to evolve and to move forward. And it's interesting because I remember the conversations we had a couple of years back and seeing like LeafWire, it feels so similar to LinkedIn when I'm on there with the events and the news and the connection. It's kind of comforting in that respect where I can feel like I've been on this type of platform and it's not one of those where I'm not sure how to use it. I know exactly when I'm on. The dashboard's clean. I see the events. I see the news. I see the people who are 
pretty, pretty vocal about what their interests are. Post to LinkedIn where I get tons of people saying, hey, I just want to connect. This one, there's actually like a purpose and a feasibility in their connection, right. which really helps me when I'm trying to allocate my time towards the social media. I find value in the platform. So I want to take it one step kind of back to the current, your day-to-day in Leaf Fire. Obviously, there's a million things going on in cannabis, and your time is really valuable to how you want to help grow the platform. But what specifically can you take us through what your role is like on a day to day basis? Well, it basically shifts throughout the year, depending, uh, you know, as CEO, if we're fundraising, I'm very heavily invested time wise in fundraising, helping create materials, helping strategize about what, what we should be doing, reaching out to investors, having calls, creating reports and things like that. Other times, uh, my partner heads up kind of the tech side. We have a development team in Sri Lanka. uh, So my partner kind of manages them and heads up product development and just overall strategy of what we're we're creating on a day-to-day basis. And I have another partner who is now VP of marketing, who heads up kind of sales operations and marketing. Um, And we're right now actually hiring for, for a VP of sales as well. Uh, so currently, uh, as things shift, since we don't have a VP of sales right now, I'm spending a ton of time doing sales. Uh, a lot of our revenue comes from advertising and our revenue and on the platform. So while we're hiring someone, one, I spend a lot of time interviewing people. And then two, I spend a lot of time filling that gap. So it's kind of like any startup, you do whatever needs to be filled at that specific time. So it's it kind of changes all the time. Yeah, you wear many in Dell that version. So let's kind of take it a couple steps further. The the future roadmap for LeapWire. Obviously, we know the current direction of where it is now, but where where do you foresee it moving towards as the industry kind of evolves? Is it going to be location based? Are you going to try to get it down to where for us East Coasters who are new to the space, you're going to kind of formulate more of the information on a more personalized note, or are you going to take it more general broad? where others can kind of find whatever they're looking for? Well, I mean, I guess the answer is kind of both. Uh, One, we're changing a database from one to another so that we can optimize the newsfeed based on each user. So right now, everybody sees the same newsfeed. Whatever you see is the same as what I see. And we know a lot of people would rather see, you know, only specific kind of news. They only want to see stuff from people they're connected with. So... We're, we're optimizing the, the, the database and the way we show that so that people will actually be able to curate and see almost exactly what they want to see in the newsfeed. So we are doing that. We are, though, you know, anticipating having more and more of an international footprint. I mean, right now we're about, I think it's like 92% U.S., 5% Canada, and about 3 or 4% international. So we do already have members from Brazil, the U.K., Germany, Argentina, and all over, all over the place. And you'll see people on LeafWire posting pretty regularly. So we do want to continue to participate in some international conferences, some international podcasts, some get our, help continue to get our name out there with some partners. In regard to kind of what's new for LeafWire, though, in the sense of what we're doing, uh, one, we're, we're building a mobile app right now, which everything we've done on LeafWire so far has been web-based. And you can use your phone. I mean, LeafWire works on a phone. It's web-optimized for mobile. It's not great, though. And there are some people who just prefer apps. So we, we think we can appeal to some new demographics, potentially some younger demographics, and also in, increase engagement so that even just our regular users, when they wake up in the morning, you know, a lot of the things first people do is roll over, pick up their phone, and start flipping through some apps. When you're waiting in a doctor's office, you know, when you're, you know, in line somewhere, uh, a lot of people will use that time just to check the news. Or I know personally, you know, I, I go check LeafWire, I'll check uh, something like, you know, CNN, or I'll check, uh, I, I, I use LinkedIn as well. So I'll check LinkedIn. So to have an app like that, I think will help a lot. Uh, another cool thing we're doing is we're tying in some more, you, you, you mentioned location, which is interesting. We're tying some more location-based features so that people can use us at conferences as a tool for networking. So we're right now, we're the biggest network for people to use while they're just sitting around at home. We, we want to be the biggest network that people can use just as well when they're at a conference. So we're going to do some things in there, one that's uh, geographically location-based, so you can look up on your app and see, of all the people you're connected to on LeafWire, uh, how many of them are within you know quarter mile of where you're standing? And so you could see at an event, like who's there? And then it'll give you a chance to schedule a meeting with that person. And you can schedule it through LeafWire, and you'll be able to take notes on that meeting. Uh, and then when you leave the event, all of your notes, all your contacts are still in there. Because I find the thing that's frustrating when you go to an event and you use a lot of events have a mobile app, you download it. It's something you've never heard of or Kuva or you've used it once or twice. 
you use it and you uh, set up meetings and this and that, but when you go home, you never open that again. So all of the contacts you made, everything are kind of lost and it's wasted. So the idea is if you can, every time you connect with someone, we also want to make it, and there was a company that did this back in like, I think the mid to late 2000s that kind of went away, but we want to make it so that if you're on LeafWire, you can essentially hit a button and get connected with someone else via their mobile phone, via, you know, some uh, location technology. So have it happen at like NFC or something like that so that you get connected immediately without having to exchange business cards, which in our post you know, pandemic world, not everyone wants to hand business cards back and forth all day long, or even remember to carry them around anymore. So imagine if you could just connect with everyone, just hit a button on your phone, and now they're connected to you. And there's a little tag that says you met them at this conference. So when you get home, you can use your LeafWire network and look up and say, oh, who are those people I met at MJ Biz? And they're all in your LeafWire network where you're connecting with people anyway. So the idea is to be to add a bunch of those mobile features that make networking at conferences easier. I think that's that's, such a good idea. Yeah, I think that's such an important point because I I think, you know, trade shows have been around since the beginning of time and they've tried to adapt from a networking stance by providing these apps. But when only, let's say, bad statistic, just going to guess, 30% of the users are downloading the app and I want to connect with you specifically and I'm sending you messages, but you've never downloaded the app, there's no connection. So having some sort of, universal tool where I don't have to go to the conference, download the app, then hope that people are using it. Just having one tool that I can rely on that has all that information is so, so valuable because I mean, like that part is such a headache. And then the the business cards that you pushed on, like how many times, Kellen, have you lost a card of someone where you're like, oh, this guy was a great contact. I got to email him. You come home, you've got 200 cards, you're exhausted. And you're like, which, which one was it? So so, Kellen, is that, is that a tool you would consider using? Because obviously it's, it's connecting on a real pain point that you and I have had for a ton of time. No, totally. And I was, uh, this is, that's so funny you say that, uh, <laughs> mention all those features, Peter, because I was actually trolling the internet looking at these new credit cards that they have that have like a RFID chip in them that mm-hmm. literally link to all your personal information. So then the idea is you take the little credit card and you like put it up against someone's phone and it'll just automatically pull your contact information into their phone. But then now you have all of these contacts just floating around in your phone. So with LeafWire, I think it's brilliant because it it creates a database for you as well, like a record, right? So then you can go home, you get back on your LeafWire and you're like, okay, here's all the people I contacted. It's organized, it's sorted, it's all clean. So I think that that's absolutely a brilliant idea from a a networking standpoint at at conferences. Yeah, uh, I I have the same pain point. That's kind of part of the reason we came up with this strategy uh, you know, you get home from a conference and you have, you know, a stack of a hundred cards or something. And the last thing you want to do is sit there and enter them all into your sales <laughs> yeah, your home. So it's annoying, right? You're, so you're, you're behind on everything the, the day you get home. So, you know, a lot of times people just don't. Uh, people follow up, I find at a lot of conferences is ridiculously low. I've, I've gone to conferences, walked around. And when we first started LeafWire, I would go to conferences and go table to table, hand out a card shake their hand, get their card, you know, invite them to join LeafWire. And then when I got home, I would literally email every single one of those people and invite them digitally uh, and work pretty well. I would, in return, literally, I'd, I'd hand out, you know, 100, 200 cards. I would have probably one person contact me and they, they were probably someone like selling insurance or something. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so the quantity, I've always found that when you go to a trade show, it is hundred percent up to you to follow up with who you want to. Like I always assume like no one else will follow up, Like you have to be the one to do it and proactively take the step that you want to happen. I think it's also pretty wild that it's taken this long for us to move away from a paper information, right? Like we were literally surrounded by computers 24 seven and we're still just handing out paper with our information on it. <laughs> like, <That's laughs> a little crazy. Yeah. And I mean, it's even crazier too, because like when you, when you digest as a business, you digest the total cost of a trade show event. And then to just think about the connections, which are the most valuable part of the trade show are being kind of like a forgotten part of the investment. You're wondering like, how are companies evaluating these investments in these trade shows? Because the follow-ups are completely broken and that's really where all the business right. is really invested in. So if you're, if you're able to kind of pitch the business and say, Hey, like, we know it costs $70,000 for you, your team to do this trade show, regardless of the other wasted time of travel, missed emails, delays, all those things. Now you have a real tool to kind of connect and follow up so that those business opportunities aren't left to like the salesperson who like might get to it or the person who has to enter the cards in. It's a huge, huge pain point. And I mean, I think you, you can really nail down in a niche community 
like cannabis, which is ever evolving and find a tool like that, that can help automate the process to make a massive difference. Yep. We, we hope so. That's our goal. We, we want to make it all parts of it easier for people and to be the, like, like you said, the universal kind of tool for people to use. Um, and it just makes it easier because you, you made the point, you know, maybe 30% of people download an app. How, what percentage of those people know how to use it? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> Helen doesn't even use it. Like I'm sitting at the trade show yelling at him. I was like, did you message this person? He's like, I didn't download the app yet. And it's like, well, great. Dude. <laughs> right. There's, there's a learning curve. Like you download some brand new thing and you're like, which, which tab do I go to? And like, who's on here? Uh, so if, if there's something that everyone's already using, it's so many times easier to just open up your phone and be like, Oh, Here's the, and we also want to work, this is kind of another step further, but work, work with conference organizers and make it so that we can actually upload, say, the agenda to a conference into LeafWire. We can upload the map of the place into LeafWire. We can upload whatever information they want so that you can actually even, you don't need that paper guide. You don't need, which a lot of people are trying to get rid of anyway. MJ Biz, I think, already got rid of their, their paper, you know, the little thing they hand out. Uh, so if you also on your phone, were you ready with the LeafWire app? If at every event you go to, you can just click agenda, you can click, you know, map, or you can click meeting, uh, schedule meetings. And it just makes it so it, it eliminates the need for all these other extra things. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people like hand really valuable documents to someone else and then just turn the corner and bump it right in the trash. Yep. And the trash. Or even worse, right? Like you, you're like, oh, this is really valuable stuff. I'll look at it later. And you, you come home after the three days, you've got just pile of shit on your hotel and you're like, I don't remember how I'm going to ever go through any of these. There's handwritten right. notes across the board. It's just ridiculous. And to go back on Kellen's point, you're right. Like the way we're operating now with all the technology and to think that we're utilizing these pieces of paper to transfer information, is just it's ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Agreed, 100%. So let's go into the recent investment into Seed Invest. Can you share some more details about that? I was really curious to learn, you know, how, how that thought process came about and, and kind of how that went. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that was essentially born out of necessity from the pandemic. Uh, we were in the middle of raising a convertible note in 2020. Uh, I was about halfway through. It was going pretty well. And then March hit. And, you know, it was kind of like, there was so much fear and uncertainty. People didn't know, you know, if, if we're going into this huge depression, people didn't know if, you know, if uh, the pandemic was going to get 10 times worse. I mean, there was no vaccine. People had no idea would real life start up again ever. Uh, so we found one, everyone all of a sudden was afraid to be spending money doing anything. And the people who had money, so the VCs who, who have funds, and they have money already ready they were so worried about all their current companies. So each VC already has, say, 10 or 20 companies they've invested in. They know those 10 or 20 companies might be struggling and they're going to have to reinvest more money to keep their companies afloat. So all of the existing VCs who had money were doing that. So they were holding back and they were withholding funds for their own companies for reinvestments. So I essentially pounded my head on a wall for about nine months trying to raise money and had very little success. And then started talking to some crowdfunding companies. We hit it off with Seed Invest. They, they liked the platform. They wanted to do it. And so we started a campaign and uh, it worked. So we finished the note. We, we raised a total of about a million dollars. And it was it was great because it was, you know, I don't want to say it's a last ditch effort, but it was basically an alternative. It was the, the next thing to do besides just reaching out to investors directly. And at the time, it you know it worked. Uh, I will say though, it was definitely stressful. You have to reach a certain level before you can kind of. So even if you raise say six hundred or seven hundred, you have to get to X before you can actually withdraw funds. So you can go through the entire process, and if you don't reach some minimum, you don't get anything. Okay. And Seed Invest sets it up like that because they're trying to ensure you have enough for, to run. So they don't want to put their investors' money into something that's going to run out of money soon. So they they have those minimums, and we didn't reach the minimums until essentially the last week of a 60-day campaign. So I didn't know for 50 days if it was going to work or not. Wow. So it was very, uh, a lot of early mornings, a lot of begging and pleading people we know to come on, you know, invest. Uh, and it, it worked. So I'm, I'm thankful for it, but it was definitely a, it, it wasn't easy and it was a relatively stressful process. But, you know, at, at the time that was, you know, the, kind of the, the, the best we could hope for. Yeah. And then, and- in cannabis, nothing is really easy, right? You, you yep. can't take the traditional route. And I think like, I would like it if you could kind of expand on that, where like some of the options that are, that are open to other industries, 
are just not afforded here in cannabis and everything is harder. So, I mean, can you kind of take us through some of those traditional routes that weren't affordable to you or what not available to you? Well, so I guess to, to answer that in a slightly different way, uh, first, I get a lot of people come to me with brand new companies that want to raise money and they want to know what investors should I reach out to? What VCs? And I basically tell most of them, like n- none of them, like no, no investors or VCs want to hear about your brand new company that has no traction, you know, that you just started that mostly, and this is kind of true in tech as well. You have to go kind of the friends and family around to start to get some traction. You have to get people who know you and believe in you to invest, not that require proof that it's working or traction or anything like that. So for most brand new companies, that's mostly the only thing available. And this wasn't true back in like, I'd say like 2015, 16, 17, 18. A lot of the VCs, everyone was investing in brand new companies because cannabis was so new. Any new company, people had money and they just wanted to jump on. You know, a year or two later, there's hundreds and hundreds of startups and the VCs are getting flooded with everything under the sun. So now they only want to put their money into things that are kind of series A or later. And they want to see people that are generating at least, you know, 50 to 100K a month that have some proven product market fit that have like a, like an executive team in place that seems, you know, professional and seasoned. They would rather do that and spend more money than invest, you know, in early stage companies because they know it's going to take them a lot more time, a lot more risk. So it, there, a lot of the investing shifted from early seed stage to series A. So another answer to your question, uh, I mean, the, the most obvious thing that's not available to cannabis companies is larger institutional investors, a lot of private equity. Most of those funds have mandates in their company directives that they are not allowed to invest in anything that's federally illegal. It doesn't matter if it's legal in a state or even if it's uh, an ancillary company like, like LeafWire. Like we don't touch the plant. We don't sell anything. We're just a tech platform, but like no... Typically, most big technology venture capital companies or private equity or institutional investors w- won't touch anything with the word cannabis involved with it. So that's definitely locked out. A lot of loan programs as well uh, aren't available to plant touching companies if they're federal, like SBA loans, that sort of thing. So you're really focused on starting off friends and family. And then, you know, once you get some revenue, some traction, you can start going to you know, there's lots of other investors in cannabis. And then once you get to like a series A, you can actually hit up the VCs. You know, there's tons of funds out there that we all know that, you know, like Merida Capital or Poseidon or uh, Arcadian that all have, you know, 100 to 200 million in their funds. And they're great at that point, but most of them aren't, aren't interested until you get there. It's hard. I, it's, it's like hearing you say that just kind of brings back some of the conversations we've had with partners who, where they, they've come to us, especially during the pandemic and said, hey guys, can can you help us? Like we're running out of capital and everywhere we turn, people are closing the doors on us. And, you know, I had friends outside industry go like, well, why can't they go like X? And it's like, well, X isn't available to people in the cannabis space right. because it's federally legal. And they're like, well, that's silly. And it's like, I agree. It's definitely silly, but still doesn't help them on how they can not close their doors. So Kellen, I mean, do you think other companies, especially in cannabis will take a similar approach going forward? I do. I mean, there's the, I think until there's actual reform from a federal level that they're going to have to kind of take every option that they have available to them, Um, especially if they're pre-money, right? If if they're pre-money, like it's really, really limited from an options standpoint. And if you are pre-money, you better have someone who either has an accounting background or is a CFA on your team because a lot of uh, VCs and a lot of angels and high net worth individuals, like Peter was saying, jumped in just very excited about the industry, especially when California first went legal. People were throwing money around, just trying to get uh, their share of this market that's going to be massive. But it turns out that cannabis isn't tech and it's still federally illegal. So it hasn't grown like the tech industry grows, right? And you don't see these zero to $100 million companies that often. It takes a long time to build these robust, vertically integrated MSO kind of uh, focused companies. And a lot of investors also got burned really, really hard, right? They jumped in super eager, eyes wide open, like, let's go. Cannabis is, is going to be the next big thing. And a lot of the entrepreneurs in the space just weren't the right entrepreneur, I guess, for lack of a better uh, way to describe some of those individuals. But they got burned. And then that really kind of forced a lot of the investors into these kind of groups. Right. So now you see like 
Poseidon and Arcview, where the accredited investors kind of group together to help vet potential different opportunities right. for, for investment because there's strength in numbers, right? They were like, okay, I got burned by myself. Now I'm going to go out and team up with all these other individuals so that at least we have a fighting chance in terms of figuring out the needle in the haystack, right? And so right. hopefully the Safe Banking Act passes and a lot of these other means of obtaining capital become available to plant touching businesses as well as ancillary businesses. And I think we're going to start to see that change, right? I mean, Schumer mentioned that that's probably going to be one thing that he uh, integrates into that bill he's putting together as far as making it uh, institutions available to invest in, in the industry without any of the downside that the federal government has kind of threatened them with from an investment standpoint. But until that happens, it's you got to find every source available and crowdsourcing, I think is probably one of the, the smarter ways to go. I know that the, it's, there's a lot more paperwork and you tend to end up probably have to deal with a lot more investors and just kind of more busy work, but at least you're still, still doing it. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. That's, that's true. There's a little bit more reporting uh, once you do a public raise like that, not a ton, but there definitely is more, uh, more work. I think the point that you said, Kellen, too, like needs to be said louder is because how many times have we been a part of these groups where they're like, we're going to raise 10 million? And our first question is, who's operating the funds? Like, who's distributing the money? Who's, who's making these decisions? Because as an investor, like, that's going to be your first question, right? Like, you got five or six people who are all good at different skills, but you're going to hand them a check for $10 million and say, good luck, guys. Like, just figure it out. No worries on that. None of you guys have any sort of financial background. So just divvy up the money individually and just like wish me the best of luck. And, and that's the crazy part, though, is that like, you don't need that much money. I mean, obviously, in some instances, you certainly do because cannabis is expensive. But I think to go back to what you said, Peter, like you have to start sometime. And that means having a minimal viable product and just demonstrating that you can put the piece of the puzzle together and any sort of experience that you have in your, your previous background or entrepreneurial spirit can make a big difference. But it's also different challenges in cannabis. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, for sometimes is people have these grand doso ideas, but are unable to actually start and put the pieces going forward. And I think as an investor, you don't want to invest in someone who's not able to kind of actionize based on their ideas. You want someone that is can actually do what they say, continue to push forward. Because as a as an entrepreneur, there's buyers every day in every other area, and you have to be able to prioritize the needs to continue to wear different hats to grow your business. Yep, definitely. It, there, a, a lot of skills and experience definitely does come through from your past, but there are also lots of brand new challenges and cannabis has all of its own problems. So both of those things are very true. Some of them silly, right? Like we can all agree that they're silly challenges, but the challenges of the challenges, regardless of what we think of them. Very true. So let's go slightly different approach. The biggest misconception since you've been in the cannabinoid space. The biggest misconception. Well, in general, most people who aren't, aren't in the industry think it, it's easy to run a cannabis company, first of all. Uh, they think people are just making money hand over foot. They they think everyone's just raking in the dough, uh, with, without realizing that you know how many people are there that you know I met three years ago that I thought were super experienced and had such great companies, and half of them are all gone now. Uh, so there's still so many that come and go that you know it, it's just like any other like most startups do fail, and in cannabis it might be even harder because it's such a untested industry and so many things are changing and the laws and regulations make things so hard. So it's probably even more challenging than any other industry. Perfectly said and hits home really, really, really deep. Uh, before we do prediction times, we ask all of our guests to, if you could sum up your experience in the cannabinoid space into one main takeaway or lesson learned, pass onto the next generation, what would that be? I would say to be open to collaboration and be honest with what you don't know. Uh, I think there's... People need to work together in this space. And if you don't, if you're not really good at marketing, or if you're not really good at finance or to find the people that are and actually work with them and have them on the, your team or partner with them or do trades of your services and theirs or just work together. I think the, one of the most valuable things we've done at LeafWire is we've done tons and tons of collaborations with everyone from recruiting companies to media companies to you know, conference companies. Uh, and it's, it's, it's helped us in a huge way. That's really well said. Prediction time. Five years from now, will LeafWire be more valuable to operators in the industry or for companies outside looking to get into the industry? Well, of course, we want to be the most valuable connection and networking communication tool for the whole industry. 
So I, you know, have to one, say that in five years from now, I would hope that almost everyone in the industry has the LeafWire app in their mobile phone and is using it at every single conference they go to for their, you know, for their meetings, their connections, their networking, and that, you know, we're just the go-to platform for all of networking communication. So, I mean, that has to be, you know, super important. But of course, um, I don't know if it has to be a one or the other answer, but uh, assuming we are that, if you want to get into the industry, obviously that we would be the most important tool or access point you could have because, you know, you could go to LinkedIn, but you're going to have everything else on LinkedIn. And if all you want is cannabis and hemp industry, you know, news, events, connections, learning, et cetera, you know, we would be the most, you know, probably important thing for them to do. So I'll say both. Alan? He took my answer. I was going to say both as well. Because I think one other feature that a lot of people, it doesn't occur to them if they're not in the in the industry is you can't advertise if you're a cannabis company on LinkedIn. You can't advertise on Google, right? Like these platforms are not available because of their company directives that say you're we're not allowed to advertise for federally illegal companies, right? So I don't think that that's going to change until federal legalization changes. And that could be five years. And so I'm going to say both because if you're looking to get in the, in the industry, then LeafWire is going to be the gatekeeper, right? In terms of getting your name out there, advertising the service that you're trying to sell to the industry, right? And if you're in the industry, it's going to be the best way to kind of see what's going on from a, a trending standpoint, what products are kind of popular, who's doing what, and, and what companies are trying to enter the space. So I'm going to say both as well. I know that's kind of a cop-out answer, but I think it's the right one. <laughs> I agree that they don't, they both work in parallel, right? And obviously the inner workings of LeafWire will be really beneficial for operators in the space. But I think from an actual valuation standpoint, I think the outside companies will get more value from having a platform where hypothetically they could fish in knowing that all the fish in that pond are people in the cannabis space. It's like you were saying, Peter, it's like you go to LinkedIn and you get inundated with just like random things across the board. And sometimes time is so important where you don't want to spend the time trying to navigate between. If it's a cannabis company, if not, you want to know right now, I want people in the space. Here's, right. here's where I can go. And I think for these outside companies that are looking to migrate in, they want to skip this massive kind of first step, second step, third step. They want to be operating in because the, the cannabis industry is exploding and market share opportunities is still being fought over across the board. And the quicker you can get in and the quicker you can start claiming that market share, the quicker you can start building that moat to separate yourself in an industry that is literally still in its infancy stage. And right. I think while it will be incredibly valuable for operators, I think it'll be more valuable for people outside looking to kind of understand the pulse and exactly how the industry operates. Yeah, I can agree with that as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Brian, that it's already a targeted audience if you're trying to uh, get a product into the space. So. Yeah, the first, the first thing when you're marketing is understanding where are the fish that you're looking to catch up, right? Where are they operating? And if you've got to do seven to 10 different platforms, it's going to be expensive. You're not going to be as targeted as you want. And you're likely going to miss a bunch of the times. But if you can fish in a location, you know you're looking for a specific type of salmon. I mean, all day, every day, these companies right. are just going to be throwing the bait in, just being like, oh, we're going to land another one. Boom. And for these outside investors who are looking to invest in companies, specifically in cannabis, right? You can turn to the various platforms, but you want to kind of hear the messaging, the voice. You want to understand more about the leaders, how they position themselves, some of the news, and you got to have a targeted place to kind of do all that. Very well said. Thank you. Peter, before we wrap, where can our listeners learn more about you? Obviously, we'll tag LeafWire in the show notes, but if they want to get in touch with you, you know, where can they find you specifically? Well, of course, I'm going to say LeafWire to start off. You know, if anyone out there is not a member, please come join the community. It's 100% free to join. You can access all the different features. You can connect with people. You can learn about the industry, uh, learn about events, et cetera. So come join us at LeafWire.com. You know, the bigger our community, the stronger it is. You can also reach me at Peter at LeafWire.com. Are you automatically connected with everyone's profile like Tom from MySpace? Uh, A message goes out from me to everybody offering to connect with them. But yes, you're you're not automatically connected like Tom. You're the next Tom from MySpace. And honestly, if you're you're too young to know who Tom from MySpace is, I I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Peter. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. 